But Paul, a, a lot to discuss this week. How are you doing? Doing well. Doing very well. Uh, stayed up, uh, as, as always, on Monday night and watched that game. And uh, I thought there were a lot of interesting parts to it from both sides, positive and negative, thinking about the, the 49ers and the Rams. So I'm hoping you want to start there because I think that game uh, gave us a whole lot to talk about. What is interesting right now is that I really felt coming into that game is that, you know, the the San Francisco 49ers had basically kind of saved their season with uh, a not so beautiful win over the Chicago Bears a couple of weeks ago. Then they had a disheartening loss to Arizona. And to me, I felt like Kyle Shanahan, uh, his coaching staff, and his players understood that coming into the Monday night game with a record of three and five, they understood the importance of this game. And, you know, I'm watching the game, and from the 49ers' point of view, I just sort of felt like its necessity is the mother of invention. You know, Kyle Shanahan, whether he'll admit it now or not, he understands that although some of his greatest moments as a coach in the NFL, both an assistant and, and head coach, have come when he's playing bombs away football, have come when uh, he's coaching Matt Ryan in his MVP season, uh, in the Super Bowl season for the Atlanta Falcons. <clears throat> Those moments have been great, and he had quite a few in the 49ers Super Bowl season as well. But I think that Kyle Shanahan in recent weeks has basically determined that even though we're going to have to use the third, fourth, or fifth running back on our roster that we thought would be that number coming into training camp, we're better right now at lining up and sort of punching you in the mouth and running the ball very well. And I think that's what we saw on Monday night against the Rams with Elijah Mitchell. And, and you know, it's amazing to me, Paul, for a defense that was so good last year at all facets of the game. You know, the Rams are showing some real issues right now with teams that want to be physical against them. And you know, we've seen it the last couple of weeks, Tennessee and now San Francisco. And so you're right, a lot to discuss. But I, I wonder, didn't you think that that was sort of a desperation team Monday night uh, in the 49ers? Absolutely. And the, the contrast in the effort and the energy of the Niners last night compared to what we saw last Sunday and Peter, I think we talked about it on the podcast. I felt like that was kind of a desperation, sense of urgency kind of game that, that should have been coming for the 49ers last week against Arizona. And they just lacked any kind of effort and energy that would represent what was happening in the standings in the NFC West. And where we are in the NFL calendar, what wasn't there last Sunday was there last night for the 49ers. And it really stood out because we just didn't have it at all for them the last weekend. And to make it even more, I mean, whether you want to call it ironic or coincidental, you had the Rams defensively. You mentioned there a little bit about what they were doing. Didn't it look to you like, like they were just kind of playing at half speed too? I mean, as the Niners just kept running and kept running and kept running, there was no sprinting to the football. There was no second, third, and fourth guy there uh, to, to kind of help out his buddy and make a big hit once the guy had been stood up. Uh, I thought it stood out a lot the lack of energy and physicality that the Rams had just as much as it did the week before when the 49ers laid that egg against Arizona at home. I would agree. I think that one of the things I noticed in this game is almost no matter what the 49ers wanted to do, especially early on that 11 minute drive, really an 11 minute drive is a test of will. That's what it is. You know, no defense should ever have an 11-minute drive against it. That was, and that to me told the story of the whole game, that 11-minute drive. I thought there were two huge things in this game, not to microanalyze and go down on this game, but 
when uh, in the first quarter when Matthew Stafford threw a perfect ball to Tyler Higby. And Higby, in essence, that will be the one of the easiest interceptions ever uh, for Jimmy Ward. And it, Tyler Higby handed it to him on a silver platter. Ball is right in his hands, and he literally flips it up, and it's right in Jimmy Ward's hands, and he goes in for a touchdown. And to me, I just, I think that said so much about this game that no team, I, I, we all think that the Rams are better than the 49ers, but no team can win a game against anybody right now when you play like that. And and look, I think the 49ers took advantage of a lot of things that the Rams didn't do well. Um, but the other overriding point, Paul, is that I thought that you know, Matthew Stafford in this game, when his job essentially is to move the chains. Now, granted, with some new players, he got zero help from his receivers. You know, Cooper Cup with a huge drop. Uh, Tyler Higby after that, you know, ridiculous, uh, you know, assist on the interception that was turned out to be a pick six, you know, <laughs> That goes on Matthew Stafford's record. And then Tyler Higby in the second half, an easy catch on third down that he dropped that forced another Rams punt. I don't know. There, were a, there was a lot in that game. You don't want to have all these alarm bells ringing for the Rams right now, but I think some worrisome things come out of that game if I'm Sean McVay and... Look, maybe it's good that you have a bye week, so you have 13 days to stew now before you get to play again. But I'll tell you what, the, the Rams have to be asking themselves a lot of questions going into the bye week. I think if there's one thing, Peter, that this season has taught us, this first season where there's 17 regular season games, we can't get too worked up, as you said, have too many alarm bells go off with, with one performance that's wonderful or one performance that's really poor. Um, even the best teams have had at least one game where you're like, that's that's not the team I recognize. I think where you where we as educated fans should start to take notice, though, is if it becomes a pattern, if it happens twice. And now this is twice in a row for the Rams where this passing game downfield and ripping off chunks of 10, 15, 20 yards consistently in the passing game and scoring touchdowns. It's not happening. And it's not just a stretch of one half or one game. It's two games in a row. So with this off week, whatever defenses are doing differently against them to prevent their success downfield or whatever Matthew Stafford and his playmakers are not doing, something is happening there that's lesser than because now it's two weeks in a row. And I, I would say one final thing on the Niners. If you take out at this point of the season, Peter, their best performance and their worst performance. So let's say their best was last night. Their worst was two games ago at home against Arizona. In the middle, you have a team that was pretty close. And Jimmy Garoppolo, more times than not, playing pretty well. I know he's had some bad moments, but this is a team that's been teetering on close with their quarterback doing a pretty good job most of the year. And now it, it feels easy to buy into that when you look at their peers, who they're competing with to be this team to, to come out of 500 or below 500 to make the playoffs. The Niners, when they have it going, have a lot going for them. And they have a lot of history of success with that kind of pattern. So uh, I know they just played well 12 hours ago, so it's easier to buy in. But uh, the team does have an identity to go to, you know, kind of in the second half of the season. You know, the last thing I would just say, Paul, is that the reason why I look at the 49ers with a little bit of a different eye this week now, number one, in, in their two wins – against Chicago and against the Rams. They ran for 301 yards total. And so I think that they might have done some good work now in understanding that even though they've devoted so much time and draft capital and energy toward rebuilding their passing game, you know, signing Jimmy Garoppolo for a lot of money, drafting uh, another young quarterback which, you know, it's, 
it's it's almost you know it's almost really odd when you look at how much energy draft capital and all that that they've spent you know going back to the first round pick with with Brandon Ayuk and 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 all the uh, all the stuff all the all the capital basically both in free agency and the draft that they've spent on their passing game and now it's almost like you look at it and you say well you know now uh, the lowly Elijah Mitchell Mitchell and their running game really is going to save their season and look good on Kyle Shanahan for knowing that it's a good time to pivot and knowing that why are we going to try to force a passing game that right now just isn't working great and make the passing game the complementary piece. So I think that's a good idea. The one other thing I would say about the Niners, if you look at their schedule coming up, I mean, they go three of the next four on the road, but every one of those three games is a game that I'm not saying they're going to win or whatever, but they can be competitive and they can win. They At Jacksonville, then Minnesota at home, at Seattle, at Cincinnati. So this is the time. They're four and five. This is the time. This is the stretch of their season, in my opinion, that we're going to find out if they're really, really contenders. They're gonna, they can get to 500 with a win at Jacksonville this week. So, I, I mean, just my thought, I still think the 49ers might be a factor. We'll see. Paul, I want to get to our second topic, and that is Patrick Mahomes. Had a, had a conversation with him Sunday night after they played uh, and beat, very impressively, the Raiders in Las Vegas. First of all, before we get started and what I learned in talking to Mahomes after the game, I do want to ask you your opinion from being uh, a very close watcher of this team and what you have seen in their passing game this week versus what you saw in, say, the previous month. I thought there was a real commitment from the start by Andy Reid and Eric Bieniemy, and of course Patrick Mahomes in there as well, to, I don't want to use the term easy throws because none of it's easy, but to have throws completions behind the line of scrimmage to have completions right in front of Patrick Mahomes. And that was the majority of what they did. The Travis Kelsey in front of Mahomes, you know, some kind of swing pass to a back or a wide receiver behind the line of scrimmage with a little bit of Patrick's talent and downfield accuracy and how wonderful he is at that part of the game, a little bit of that sprinkled in. But, but as I watched Peter, I, I thought I could just picture a meeting at the beginning of the week between Patrick Mahomes and Andy Reid and Andy Reid saying, okay, here's the deal. I'm going to dial up some really good formations, some great motions. I'm going to put you in a wonderful spot to have some quick, easier type of completions early in the game. If you promise to go through the progression, get to the top of your drop, yeah. look where it's supposed to go. If it's not there, drop it off. And it happened time and time and time again. It's like they got together and had that packed after everything we saw the last two weeks. And I sat down just before the podcast, Peter, and watched the game again. And I created a chart on the left side. It said, ball comes out on time. And on the right side, frenetic, crazy, what we've seen the last two months. And it was about six to one, ball coming out on time compared to Mahomes doing some of the Mahomes things. But sometimes it goes well in the last couple of months, haven't gone well. So whether it was more, the play calling or more Patrick's commitment to stay in the pocket and go to his backs and tight ends. It was a clear stark difference. What we saw Sunday compared to the way the style they've been playing the last two months. You know, I thought really two of the most interesting things that, that I saw in the game were reflected in a, in a post game conversation I had with them. And, and I'll tell you the two things that I thought were interesting Number one, let's go back to that Giants game on Monday night. It almost seemed like Patrick Mahomes had a restrictor plate on him, to use a NASCAR analogy. You know, if, if you've got a guy in the end zone and he's sort of open and he wants to make that throw and he goes like this, but he doesn't quite make the throw, maybe in the past, he would have 
tried to zing one in there and he wasn't doing it. And I think one of the things that we saw is reflected in a conversation that Mahomes told me that he and Andy Reid had uh, in the days before the game. And I'll quote him. He just kept reiterating to me, be myself, go out there and play. Take the check down when it's there and when it's right, but don't lose who you are. And look, if you sign Patrick Mahomes to play quarterback for your team for almost three million, almost three million dollars a game, and, and, and you know you don't want to get it down to that, but that's basically what we're talking about. You know, he's making forty-five million dollars a year, and. If you sign a guy because of the kind of player he is, that is what you want him to do, be himself. But the other thing, Paul, and this came up to me in his touchdown pass to Darrell Williams. Uh, and it was when he was scrambling around, he almost stepped over the line. I thought Fred Goodelli had a perfect little illustration you know, on the Sunday night telecast where they drew a line and they showed how when Mahomes released the ball on this 38-yard touchdown pass that he did have one foot behind the line. So the, it, he was not over the line, but he was very, very close. But what was interesting to me about that is it's almost like Patrick Mahomes kind of had his mojo back. And he makes that throw. And on that play right there, I'm sure everybody can envision it because it's been on replay a thousand times but on every highlight. Your receiver is instructed that if you can't catch it, make sure that the other guy can either. So that was either going to be a Darrell Williams catch or an incomplete pass. And I thought that what, what Mahomes did really illustrated the fact that he hasn't lost his confidence in who he is. And I think a lot of quarterbacks might have. So I asked him afterwards if he ever was either second guessing himself. I said, hey, when you look up, the fe look up at the ceiling at night, do you ever think or have you thought in the last couple of weeks, man, what's wrong with me? Or, or why is it going so wrong? And he goes, no, I didn't. And it was, it was not a hugely introspective answer. But you know what, Paul? I've got this feeling about Mahomes. Okay, and this feeling is my dad was a pitcher in Major League Baseball. One night, he would strike out A-Rod with the bases loaded. The next night, somebody hit a three-run bomb off him. And he would have to walk off the field the same you don't uh, think that you stink when you give up a three-run homer, and you don't think you're Cy Young when you strike out A-Rod either. And so the point being that he knows that there's going to be ups and downs. As Andy Reid said, geez, he played 50, 53, however many games without ever really showing signs that he could go in a slump. And this is a very long-winded way of asking you, a former Big Ten quarterback, did you ever feel like you were in a period that you just weren't playing well? Did you ever have a crisis of confidence? Uh, it, maybe you did, maybe you didn't, but I just want to know if you can identify with Mahomes saying, no, I never lost faith in myself. I can, I can hear it and respect it and admire it because... I think in one way, Peter, what you just explained is the answer to this question, you know, why do some really talented first round quarterbacks over the last 50 years not work out? And it's not arm strength. A lot of times it's not smarts or toughness. It's that confidence that is so elusive and so slippery. And it's going to be tested so much at that position that at some point it goes away and they never really get it back the way they had it at one point. Uh, but as for, for me personally, I mean, I was not, I mean, no surprise, I was not nearly as good as, as that part of the game is what Mahomes is proving to be. And I can remember my senior year 
the first half of the Big Ten schedule, Peter, we were toward the bottom of the Big Ten, and I was the lowest rated quarterback in the Big Ten Conference. And we had a stretch yeah. of those four or five games where we were struggling, where I also struggled with my confidence. Uh, a game would go poorly, and I, w I, I did lay awake and look at the ceiling and wonder how well I was playing or how well I would play the next game. And it kept kind of happening that way, uh, kind of slipping and eroding a little bit each game at a time. And it got to a point where we were in last place and I was the lowest rated quarterback and I was just like, screw it. I'm not going to worry anymore. I, I know. I mean, a month ago I was confident. I'm going to say screw it to all these other things and just kind of believe in myself the way I used to the last half of the season. I think I was the highest rated quarterback in the big 10 and we found our way to a ball game. So it took a while and I can certainly relate to, to the, the game giving you moments and weeks where your confidence slips. And if Mahomes truly doesn't worry about it and has gotten himself out of that and believes in himself, kudos to him. Because whether you're high school, college, or the NFL, it's a hard thing to get back. I know from experience, I went for a month at a time without it. Um, so if, if he's maintaining it, uh, it's one of the many reasons that he's special. Paul, as we were prepping for this podcast, one idea that I had that you sort of glommed onto is a little bit of a look into how the sausage is made. Um, on Sunday, after sausage being my column on Monday, and on Sunday, I talked to five people. We just talked about Mahomes. And you thought, and, and I think too, it'd be kind of a cool idea to go over those people, talk about yeah. what you learned from them and things like that. So I'm going to give you a shot at at sort of leading this discussion and 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 we'll go back and forth a little bit but i'll basically tell you what i learned from the people who i talked to on sunday sounds good peter and i was glad to see that you brought it up last night and we we're going back and forth during the game about the topics we were going to hit because as i was reading your article on monday morning i'm like man peter spent a lot of time on the phone on sunday night you normally talk to a couple that, that you reference in your article but there were multiple guys so um, let's begin with Matt Rule, head coach at Carolina. Hey, the Panthers are back to 500. They're back to having Cam Newton right there in the mix, if not the main guy at quarterback. What was your top takeaway from that conversation? I started by just asking him, this is after they win at Arizona. I said, what caused you to pick up the phone and call Cam Newton on Tuesday? And he said the medical report on Sam Darnold said, we knew he was going to be out for a while, maybe a long while. And I just figured, you know, this is a guy who's available, who we've heard really wants to play. They played phone tag a bit. And finally, when he got, on, got back on the phone, uh, Newton told him, yes, sir, I really want to play. Um, and then, you know, I think Matt's, re I could tell, Matt Rule did not want to say right there that, yeah, he's going to be our quarterback the rest of the way or not even he's going to be our quarterback this week. But I just got this sense that he knows that when he has practiced enough and he's ready and he's back sort of after, I guess, a little more than two months, two and a half months almost, uh, of not being in a camp on a team, once he gets into that, this week, I do think that uh, he's going to have him be the starting quarterback against Washington and then for the rest of the season. You revealed a little bit, you, you teased a little bit your conversation coming up with uh, Green Bay's young running back, A.J. Dillon. I thought your conversation with him and the, the part of it that you shared in your article on Monday Morning Theater was really revealing and refreshing about how he's experienced this success and how he is appreciating everything that's happening to him. So, uh, give us just a, a little more tease of, of what you what you took away from that conversation and kind of what made it different than some of the other back and forths you have with players. What was what I thought was interesting when I watched that game, you know, what I have to do, Paul, late in games, if there's somebody in a game that I would like to talk to, I got to send a text to the PR person or people in charge of doing interviews after the game with players. And I was really kind of stuck between thinking that, hey, I want to do maybe Adrian Amos, the, 
the, you know, the safety who had the big interception of Russell Wilson in the fourth quarter that kind of put the lid on this game. Uh, and, and he played very, very well. And the Packers unexpectedly have so many outstanding young defensive players. Uh, but I thought that the idea of winning a game when Aaron Rodgers wasn't at his best, whether it's post-COVID fatigue, whatever the reason, but Aaron Rodgers was not a big factor in this game. The, the impact of A.J. Dillon, the big back, 247 pounds, and you know, dragging Bobby Wagner into the end zone and on the first touchdown. It just you just really get the feeling that the Packers now know. And I talked about it with Dylan. You'll hear it later in our in our podcast. The Packers now know that they have other ways to win. Now it's sort of a shame that uh, when they were in uh, Kansas City a week and a half ago that maybe they didn't rely a little bit more on A.J. Dillon pushing the pile, moving the defense. Uh, so I think now they come out of that game understanding that, you know, if Aaron Rodgers is having a C-minus game, we can still win, and we can win because we can now bludgeon people. I think the, the way that they're winning with him and the way they're using him is a perfect example, Peter, of how we should be evaluating teams rushing offense right now. And it's not so much having one player who goes for 1,500 yards or in any given game has 24 right. carries for 160 yards. If a running back has 17 carries for 78 yards, that's a win. That's the running game, keeping the entire offense on schedule, allowing the quarterback to throw it 31 times instead of 41 times. He's really the perfect snapshot for, for that type of success with the ground game and also for what I think Green Bay needs with that part of it. Hey, I, I was at the I was in D.C. last season, Peter, for the, the, the playoff game between the football team yeah. and the Buccaneers. And I was I was impressed with Taylor Heineke, even though he lost. I'm like, this kid's pretty good. He's not afraid. He's athletic. He's going to cut it loose down the field. He played well, but they lost. Now over the weekend, plays well, plays better against the Buccaneers, and they win. What was your conversation like with him? Look, I, 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 when I got on the phone with him after the game, I said, hey, I've talked to you twice in my life. The first time after you lost to Tom Brady but played valiantly, and today after you beat Tom Brady and played just as valiantly. Um, and the one thing I said to him was, tell me where you were one year ago at this time. And he said, well, I was in my house in Georgia and he's actually me. He meant that he was in his sister's home because he was living as sort of the extra person, you know, the third wheel with his sister and her husband. And, you know, Paul, don't you think at knowing family dynamics that here's this guy and his brother-in-law has got to be thinking, man, will this guy give up the ghost? You're not going to be a quarterback <laughs> in the NFL. Stop. <laughs> uh, you know, just uh, go, get, go get a job. Go get a real job. And by the way, go get your own condo. <laughs> but, I, and, and, and he said, look, I just, I just kept thinking that I've still got faith that it could, that it can happen. But literally a year ago, he was taking classes online at Old Dominion where he went to college. And he was taking classes online just hoping somehow some way the phone would ring. And actually it would have been 3 weeks later, uh right after Thanksgiving, I think very early December that Washington called them. And, you know, last year, remember, if you get called as a free agent and you're on the street, you have to go quarantine. So he said, I just stayed in a hotel right near the Washington facility. I couldn't leave my room. I couldn't do anything. And I stayed there until uh, I was able to quarantine for a long enough time and pass enough COVID tests where I could then rejoin the team. He was on the practice squad. Uh, he had to play because of injury and, and the rest is history. But in this particular game, 
what I thought was really interesting is that last year he knew that, hey, what do I have to lose? Uh, I'm just going to let it all hang out. This game, he was so efficient. And that, you know, what was really brilliant, I thought, you know, by the WFT staff in this game is, look, as much as possible, let's play keep away from Tom Brady. And that's what they did. They had a 10 minute and 46 second drive. And, you know, just imagine really in the eight quarters that this guy has played against Tom Brady, he's outscored him 52 to 50. It's just, I don't know. There are some stories that, that just, I'm not saying they defy description, but are pretty amazing. And this is certainly one of them. And the, the fact that he went 26 out of 32 against that defense says a lot. And I, when I, when I was watching him earlier, I thought, okay, this is a guy who can be around 50% because he sprays it all over the field, but he's never really going to be that efficient. And I think that giant step in efficiency that he took Sunday really stands out. I thought there was a real collegiate type scene at, at the end of the Patriots routes over the Browns where Jacoby Myers scored a touchdown. And, and it wasn't just your garden variety routine celebration. He, he had a lot of his teammates that wanted to celebrate with him. And I always make note of that and say, okay, for some reason, the guys really, really like this person who just scored a touchdown. It, it, if they make the celebration look different than the others we see. So you talked to Jacoby Myers after his first touchdown. What was that like? One of the things that you have to appreciate about the way the Patriots have formed their teams in the Bill Belichick era is that there are always room for players like Jacoby Myers, you know, Gunnar Olszewski. And if you just look at these teams... Every year, the Patriots have a few guys who either couldn't make other teams, didn't make other teams, got their shots with New England and just stuck. And, and Jacoby Myers said, me and Gunner, we talk about it like, hey, we're cockroaches. They can't kill us. Every time they would bring somebody in, some receivers in, we would say, nope, not today. And they try to just lift their games a little bit more. But that's one of the great things about, in my opinion, about how the Patriots have built their teams. And look, this is a guy who for three years, two and a half years, 134 catches, all he ever did was come in and, and just did whatever he was told, tried to help the team win in any way he could. And those 134 catches, never one touchdown. And finally, he gets a touchdown against Cleveland in the fourth quarter of this game from Brian Hoyer. And when he's in the end zone, I can't, I couldn't count it. You didn't have a great view of it from the TV copy, but it looked like there were between, say, 15 to 25 guys. I saw Matthew Judon. You saw guys from defense, you know, going yeah. and, and sort of hugging him. And he just, he was very, very humble when I talked to him. He goes, hey, I don't, I don't know why. We just, we've got a great group of guys, blah, blah, blah. I know why. Yeah. Because every day in practice, he works as hard as anybody else. Uh, he he doesn't allow himself to be injured, you know, which is an old Parcells Belichick thing, you know, to I, I don't want to see you in the trainer's room, you know. And so when you are on the edge of the roster, the way he is, he understands that. And look, I asked him because dad goes to most or all the games and I asked him about his father. And I said, what'd your father say to you? And he said, he didn't have to say anything. I saw him after the game and that look in his eyes said everything. And yeah. so it was just, those are the kind of stories that are really, really fun to discover. The whole scene, Peter, reminds me, and I think I brought it up on this podcast before, but one of my best friends in Iowa, my best receiver, Danon Hughes, made it with the Chiefs for five or six yeah. years. And he, he has told me a number of times, I thought I was getting cut every single day. I kind of laugh. He's like, Paul, I'm telling you, every, every day I'd come in, my locker's still there. My name's still above my, uh, you know, above my locker. I'm relieved. I'm happy. And I don't know Jacoby Myers. I don't know if he lives with that kind of mindset, but I think there are hundreds of guys in the league that really do. 
wonder if they're getting cut every single day. And like that part of me that remembers what that felt like and knowing that I've had friends who've lived that way, I can't help but be excited when I see a scene like that, when he's celebrating in the end zone and all of his teammates want to be a part of it with him. Paul, let's hit on three quick topics before we get out of here. Um, I'll give you my opinion on something. You give me yours. We'll start with Teddy Bridgewater and his lack of effort um, on his tackle of Darius Slay that basically either allowed Slay to run 78 yards for a touchdown or certainly contributed to it. Um, there's a lot about this I don't like. And I'll tell you what I don't like now that it's been addressed because I wrote in my column on Monday, Vic Fangio's got a problem. His starting quarterback, he's got to address this with the team. And he clearly did because on Sunday night, Bridgewater said, hey, I was just trying to funnel him to the inside so somebody could make a play. It was just a dumb answer. He was right next to him and didn't make any effort to stop him. And, and then on Monday, Teddy Bridgewater comes out of a team meeting and said, yep, totally my fault. I watched it. I cringed. Yeah, it was bad. And I don't know. That is the kind of thing that if you don't admit it right away, I really question whether you're, you've either been forced into saying that or you really don't believe it. Yeah, Peter, I mean, as, as much as things have changed in football and there are trends that come and go, and, you know, obviously there's a lot of different positions. One thing, I mean, courage, effort, and toughness. I don't care what position you play. I don't care if we're talking about 2021 or 1971. If there's a moment where your teammates can look and question your effort or your courage on any given play and everybody sees it, it, it it's hard to put that back. It, it's hard to recover from that. Uh, I know that for a fact. And that's what we saw in that one play. The one thing we don't know, we're not inside that locker room. I don't know how much goodwill equity Teddy has in the bank with his teammates in terms of the kind of person he is, the kind of player he is, if he's always right. showing toughness and effort. I don't know. Maybe he's got so much of that that he can live with this really bad sign of those three things. But if he doesn't have that built up, uh, this is a problem of stuff to come back from. Uh, been a lot of discussion about officiating. And Mike Florio in Pro Football Talk on Monday wrote that absolutely unequivocally the NFL should have full-time officials. Um, I'm not categorically against full-time officials, but I do know that of the, I think there are 117 officials in the NFL, full-time officials. Um, my guess is that probably half of them would leave uh, because they would not want to give up either their legal practice, their whatever job that they that they have. Some of some NFL officials have lucrative jobs. And so look, and, and you might have this reaction. I don't care. There's a lot of officials out there. You'll go find one. And in time, that official is going to be just fine because he'll be doing it full time. I get it. I guess, Paul, my biggest issue with this is, and, and again, no one knows because there's never been full-time officials. I wonder, is Tony Correnti, whether he's full-time or part-time, going to throw the flag on Cassius Marsh if he is a full-time official? Or is he not going to throw the flag? Is Tony Correnti going to throw the flag on the low block that clearly was the wrong call? Uh, that cost Chicago a touchdown, may have cost them a victory in this game. Th there's a lot of calls you see every week. And I think we're assuming that officials are going to be markedly better if they're full-time. And I just, first of all, we don't know. Okay, so maybe they should do it and spend a lot of money and, and all that stuff. I get it. But man, I think that you're chasing perfection. And so you always want to do everything you can. But in chasing perfection, I do think that the NFL would be opening the door for a lot of the officials to leave. I think the expectations would have to be below perfection, Peter. And that's the, that's the term I had in my mind as you're talking about it. 
that I wanted to say first, if there were full-time officials, and I think it would be a great idea, I think it would be a, a, a proper response to what's become a hot button issue, um, you know, from September through the Super Bowl. I think it would be the right way to go, considering what has happened, you know, with that part of the game the last five or 10 years. But you couldn't expect perfection. I think you could expect it to be better on Sundays and Mondays. And I also think about what the offseason could be like, Peter, if, if the officials were full-time, the kind of communication they could have with the league office on yeah. what didn't go well last fall, what are we going to emphasize this year? And then the kind of communication they could have after that, you know, being closer with the league office and what's going to be emphasized and what needs to be fixed, go to the combine, go to the senior bowl, go to mini camps. You could have official representation at all of these to be in communication with the coaches and players much more than they are right now. So there would be mistakes just like there are now, you know, on Sundays, maybe, maybe fewer, but I think the off season communication and commitment to being in touch with players and league office and coaches would be a lot better if they were full-time. And I think that could result in better performance during the fall. Paul, what's your best team in football right now? I'm going with the Packers. And I sat down and thought about this one, Peter, and it was kind of a tie right now between the Packers and the Cowboys. But I picked the Packers to go to the Super Bowl when we were talking about this a couple months ago. And if you rule out that first game, which I know you can't, but since the first game where Green Bay got blown up, every time Aaron Rodgers has been on the field, they've won. And they're not winning just because he's an excellent, awesome quarterback all the time. He's kind of been back and forth between good and really good and maybe a little bit off sometimes. But they are winning with him. He doesn't have to be an A every time. If he has a B game, they can win with that ground game and they can win with that defense. So I'm, I'm going with the Packers right now. Paul, that's my team too. That's my team also. But there you go. <laughs> I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you my number two. And it's the New England Patriots. Wow. And as everybody just sort of falls off their chairs and say, and says, you New England Homer, we always knew it. <laughs> you grew up there. You just love Belichick and everything he stands for. I'm going to tell you why I would say this. They've won four games in a row, and the average score in those four games is 37 to 13. And they're not just beating teams and edging teams, but they're playing great defense. They've allowed 13 points in the last eight quarters. They have so many weapons on defense, and especially now that Mac Jones has really kind of cut down some of his poor decisions, I think by the end of this year, they're going to be giving Mac Jones a lot of leeway to make plays. I think the Josh McDaniels, Mac Jones marriage has been really, really good. And look, my number three right now would be Buffalo. So I just think there's going to be a 21 day span in December where New England and Buffalo play twice. And those games could determine everything up to and including home field in the AFC the champion of the AFC East, and then also uh, maybe even whether you're absolutely going to be a playoff team. I'm going to say one little asterisk. I love Tennessee too. I really, really do. And I just can't get this out of my head though with Tennessee. And again, I'm not, I don't like to discuss games in this way. The New Orleans Saints got robbed on Sunday in Nashville. And in my opinion, New Orleans outplayed Tennessee and didn't win the game. They got a horrible pass, uh, uh, roughing the passer call that uh, basically ended up handing seven points to the Titans. And their own kicker, and they've got to be now looking for a new kicker, their own kicker missed two extra points in this game. And again, look, Everybody can say whatever they want about officials' calls, kickers. You got to overcome them. I get it. But when we were thinking about this little section of the podcast, pick your best team, 
I don't know. They're going to have to win a lot of games without, and maybe without uh, Derrick Henry for the rest of the year. We don't know that, but we'll see. I think there's a lot of candidates for the best team, but I would agree with you, Paul. Uh, I'm going to take the Green Bay Packers. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.